Chapter 5 from the Near of Listening by Adidas Samraj The Understanding on the Beach After my experiences at the VA hospital, I went into a period of relative seclusion to carry on my work undisturbed. Nina worked as a school teacher during this period and supported our living. My own manner of living at that time finally established a form of practice in me that had begun in college. <clears throat> it was not required that I maintain a job of any kind, and so I was free to work as I pleased. As always, I found seclusion to be extremely vital, productive and creatively necessary for my own kind of progress. The pattern of my days was mostly sedentary. This was partially dictated by a chronic weakness in my left side, particularly the left leg, due to a mild case of polio in childhood, and by certain tiny congenital bone malformations in my lower back. I had not been very noticeably disabled by this limitation, but it had led me to experience a certain tiredness and weakness in those areas if I became very active physically. Over time, my body had developed a counterbalance of muscular strength and I had always been able to enjoy strong activity in swimming and other kinds of exercise. And in later years, I would also learn how to manipulate and refresh the bone structure of the body, its, its muscular system, and the nervous system by using certain techniques of Hatha Yoga. Thus I spent my days in retirement. While Nina was away at work, I would spend the day writing. My method of writing was one of any kind of in was not one of any kind of intentional production. The writing of this present book, for instance, is a very intentional process. It involves a deliberate plan of productivity, the gathering of various notes and sources, chronological recollection and so on. I write very deliberately and almost continually for eight hours or more each day. However, in those days, my method of writing was deliberately unproductive. My intention was not to write a particular narrative I had preconceived. Rather, I deliberately and very intensively focused in the mind itself, and as a result of several years of experiment in this direction, I remained focused there without effort, almost continuously, regardless of my peculiar external involvement. This could perhaps be understood as a kind of yoga of my own creation, and it has analogies in the history of spiritual experience. But I had no separate goal in doing this. There was no other point I hoped to arrive at as a result of this concentration. I wanted to reside in the plane of consciousness at its deepest level, where all experiences, internal as well as external, were monitored. I wanted simply to become aware of what passed there. Ordinarily, people do not remain aware on the deepest level of the mind, they are concentrated either in its extensions, at the level of sense, level of sense awareness, or in the processes of concrete thought. Occasionally, a person slips into a deeper level, similar to the level to which one passes in dreams, and there he or she experiences the daydreams, the subliminal memories, emotions, and motivations that underlie his or her functioning life. It was my intention to remain continuously aware at this deepest focal point of the mind. That was also a point of which I often concentrated in the bright. It is a point deep within the head, but it monitors all the levels of functional consciousness, the physical body and the experiences of the sense organs, the vital senses, senses in the lower body, the vital centres in the lower body, the great centre of being and energy in the heart, the peculiar order of subliminal imagery that moves out of the creative centre analogous to the throat, and all the passing perceptions, the images, ideas, sensations, forms, 
memories and superconscious communications that are generated in the parts of the head. In those days, I spent all of my time concentrating in this observing function. I carried a clipboard with me wherever I went, and I would write whatever perceptions were generated in my humanly born conscious awareness. I attempted to make this writing exhaustive, so that not a single thought, image or experience would pass unrecognised. The act of writing seemed necessary to the act of becoming conscious itself. What I did not write seemed to pass away again into unconsciousness, perhaps to remain trapped there and provide matter for the hidden unconscious form that bounded, that bounded my humanly born conscious awareness and prevented the bright. Whenever I was too busily occupied to write, I would invent a catchphrase or some other monomic device in order to hold the concept or perception until I could write it fully. I became so occupied in this process that Nina would have to do anything that required practical attention. She would drive the car, communicate with friends and perform all of the usual chores within and without the household. My writing became a continuous fascinating and absorbing occupation and I began to fall naturally into a thread of consciousness and life that was profound, hidden, unfolding, inevitable and sublime. I would write at, at any and all times, even in the evenings when Nina was at home, at the movies, at parties or during walks on the beach. I would often write late into the night or I would awaken many times from sleep to recall dreams and ideas. The same process went on during sleep such that I remained conscious even during dreams or deep dreamless sleep. I continued to exploit the possibilities for experience during that time and I saw no benefits in retarding any impulses. I feared that suppression would only prevent certain necessary images or motives from releasing their living energy and significance to consciousness. I would often exploit the possibilities of sex or become deeply drunk on wine engage in orgies of eating or smoke, smoke marijuana for long hours. I became intensely sensitised to every movement in my humanly born conscious awareness. I perceived every event in the world as well, with an almost painful absorption. Every creature or environment I perceived became a matter of profound attention. I would write page after page of exhaustive observation on each step of the walk on the beach, or the day-long process and change of the ocean. There was page after page describing the objects and marks in the sand as I walked, detailed descriptions of rooms, mental environments and so on. I gradually came to enjoy a state similar to that in which I had found myself at the point of awakening in college. Eventually, I came to the point of exhausting that exercise. The simultaneity, coincidence and oneness of inside and outside became utterly obvious to me. My living awareness was uniquely and extremely intense and inclusive of everything both inside and outside the body-mind, such that I felt there was no remaining power of distraction in anything. As a result, I was utterly focused on the yet hidden depth of my humanly born conscious awareness. As I approached that point of exclusive, inclusive awareness, focused in depth, the form of my writing also began to bear fruit. My concentration, as I said, was not purposive. It was not, to, not in order to create something intentionally on the basis of what was pre preconceived in the mind. But I was always looking and listening for that very and most fundamental structure in my humanly born conscious awareness, which is prior to ordinary experience. I was waiting for the revelation of the hidden content of the mind. Not some sort of primitive event, no memory in the Freudian style or some symbolic perception which informs the content of Jungian types of introspection. These came and went, but I was attentive to the underlying structure of my humanly born conscious awareness, to the seed logic or myth that prevented the bright. As I approached that form of knowledge, which I was certain 
when previous suggestions in my deepest experience had to be there, I would often pass through profound recollections and imagery. There were the emotional and, and scatological memories of childhood and the moments of conflict in life that underlay persistent anxieties, preferences and chronic patterns. There were also times when I saw and learned the workings of psychic planes and subtle worlds. I remember once for a period of days I perceived a world that appeared to survive in our moon. It was a superphysical or astral world where things were sent off to birth on the earth or in other worlds and then their bodies were enjoyed cannibalistically by the older generation on the moon or they were forced to work as physical and mental slaves. I became very interested in the writings of C.G. Young and I sometimes experienced symbolic dreams typical of the level of consciousness he investigated. One of these coincided with a dramatic awakening that I will describe presently. But my attention could not settle in any particular impression or event. I was always driven more deeply into the underlying structure and so I always remained focused in the mind itself regardless of what passed. Eventually, I began to recognise a structure in my humanly born conscious awareness. It became more and more apparent and its nature and effects revealed themselves as fundamental, inclusive of all states and contents in life and mind. My own myth, the governor of all patterns, the source of presumed self-identity, the motivator of all seeking, began to stand out in the mind as a living being. This myth, this controlling logical force, that structured and limited my humanly born conscious awareness, revealed itself as the self-concept and the actual life of Narcissus. I saw that my entire adventure, the desperate cycle of awakeness and its decrease, a truly conscious being and its gradual covering in the mechanics of living, seeking, dying and suffering, was produced out of the image or mentality that appears hidden in the ancient myth of Narcissus. The more I contemplated him, the more profoundly I understood him. I observed in awe the primitive control that this subconcept and logic exercised over all of my behaviour and experience. I began to see that same logic operative in all other human beings and in every living being, even in the very life of the cells and in the natural energies that surround every living entity or process. It was the logic or process of separation itself, of enclosure and immunity. It manifested as fear and identity, memory, memory and experience. It informed every function of the living being, every experience, every act, every event. It created every mystery. It was the structure of every imbecile, imbecile link in the history of human suffering. He is the ancient one, visible in the Greek myth who was the universally adored child of the gods, who rejected the loved one in every form of love and relationship, and who was finally condemned to the contemplation of his own image, until, as a result of his own act and obstinacy, he suffered the fate of eternal separateness and died in infinite solitude. As I became more and more conscious of this guiding myth or logic in the very roots of my being, my writing began to take on an apparently intentional form, what was before only an arbitrary string of memories, images and perceptions leading toward an underlying logic now proceeded from the heart of that logic itself, such that my perceptions and my thoughts began to develop from hour to hour as a narrative, completely beyond any intention or plan of my external mind. I found that when I merely observed the content of my experience or all my mind from hour to hour, day to day, I began to recognise the story being performed as my own conscious life. This was a remarkable observation and obviously not a common one. The quality of the entire unfolding has the touch of madness in it, but people are mad. The ordinary state of human existence, although it is usually kept intact and relatively calmed by the politics of society, is founded in the madness of prior logic, a schism in reality that promotes the entire suffering adventure of human life in endless and cosmic obstacles. I have known since I was a boy that this round of conflict, of contradiction and consciousness was neither natural nor ultimately real, and the total and guiding purpose of my life has been, even by and in the midst of fully embracing the states of circumstances 
of conditionally manifested existence to most perfectly realize and then to communicate to all others that reality, that given form, the spiritually bright condition of consciousness itself, which is not properly the elusive goal of life, but which is the very and conscious foundation of life. Thus, in order to learn this thing, I had to enjoy the progress of my own madness. I had to observe the madman himself and undermine him with my knowledge. This madness, however, is not merely unfortunate, irrational and disruptive. It is required of all of those who would pass into real existence beyond fear and egoic ignorance. And in the process, one experiences remarkable revelations and eventually discovers and realises the synergy of the mind and every movement of energy in the world. It was this synergy or synchronicity, this conscious coincidence of the internal and external world that I discovered and realised at that time. After the pattern I recognised as Narcissus began to show its flower in the mind and I became settled in observing its creative position in the entirety of my life, the internal and external events in my experience began to demonstrate a common source, or rather, a coincident pattern. My own thoughts or images, then, began to arise in a similar pattern to my external experiences. A narrative was being constructed as my very life, which, which, which was itself a mythic form. The people, the passing events, the dramatisation of my own motives, and all the imagery and categories of my thought appeared to be generating a conceived pattern, and I knew that my own life was moving toward the very death of Narcissus. I began to write the outstanding narrative or myth that was appearing hour by hour, and I proposed to write a novel tentatively entitled The White Narcissus, which would be this very complex of my life and mind as it was and had been revealing itself in my writing over several years. I intended to follow this production in myself until I should see it worked out whole, and then I would go back through the entire manuscript, whose proportions were already enormous, and make out of it a novel that included all of the creative motivations and intentions I had generated as a writer. I was not utterly afraid even of the death of Narcissus, which was now my own death. I knew that no matter how terrible the event in terms of physical and mental and emotional suffering, it was not, in fact, the death of anything identical to my own real being. Even my own physical death appeared to me as a kind of mythic event. Its apparent consequences would perhaps be the end of my earthly life, but I was certain that I would have to pass through it in order to transcend the form of Narcissus. I knew then that all human suffering and all human deaths are endured only in the concepts, functions and mentality that are guided by the unconscious logic, logic of Narcissus. And so I devoted myself freely to the self-meditation of Narcissus in order to die his death as quickly as possible. As it happened, that death did occur very dramatically three years later, but necessary transformations in my state of life had to occur before it would be possible this point in my narrative brings us to the spring of 1964. I have observed that a certain kind of dramatic transformation in the state of my humanly born conscious awareness has occurred annually at approximately the same time each year. The springtime of every year is a time of awakening in nature, just as the autumnal period is a natural transition into latency. Peculiar events of a transformative kind have always naturally occurred to me in the springtime of the year, just as also the transitional period of autumn moving into winter has usually for me been a time of interiorization, often of a difficult kind. The cycle of my own early life experience followed this pattern exactly. Thus the event I am about to describe was one such of springtime awakening, one morning in early May 1964, I awoke with a clear memory of a significant dream. As I indicated earlier, a dream of this type, of the type often analysed by Jung, preceded a dramatic awakening in myself. I had dreamed that I was being born. At first I saw it from outside my own body. I was watching my mother from the position near the doctor's viewpoint between her legs. I could not see her face and so... I am not certain it was my natural mother in the dream. 
the body was large, fecund, and wo- and swollen. The body, of the baby appeared head first, and its face was red, ugly, wet, and bunched up like a fist. Then I took the position of the baby itself, and one of the doctors said, "It's one of those multiple babies." Then I became aware of what must have been a later period in the life of that entity. The period of view was from my own body. I assumed it was the mature body of the baby I had seen being born. Then there were cords of phlegm that rose up out of my insides through my throat and out into the room. I was uncomfortable with this gag in my throat, but I was calm, as if I had lived that way for some time. The mass of phlegm separated out into two paths in the room, and each was attached to a young man. I assumed from their appearance that the three of us were in our late teens. I also assumed that the birth of the multiple baby was the birth birth of the three of us. The first baby, whose face was like a fist, and whose baby I now inhabited, was a source of controlling entity. The other two were dual aspects of my living being. The one boy was very bright, energetic, attractive and youthful. The other was dark. His life energy was heavier and he had less mobility, physical and mental. I noticed the cords of phlegm at my feet as I moved forward and carelessly stepped on them. The act of stepping on the cords was both voluntary and involuntary, involuntary, such that I felt both aggressive and guilty or trapped. I thought perhaps the boys would die if I stepped on the cords and broke them. But I also desired to be free of the gag in my throat and the immobility our attachment required of me. But when the cords were crushed and broken under my right foot, the boys came running up to me and embraced me happily. We all appeared now bright and free, and they thanked me for cutting the cords, which they said they had long, long hoped I would do. An ordinary external observer of this dream could certify one of the several interpretations, depending upon the partial viewpoint by which he or she understands the matters of consciousness. Perhaps all the basic interpretations would bear some of the true import of this dream. But I required no interpreter. The very having of the dream marked a transformation in me. I had operated for several years in the aggravated model of my conscious being, and this dream marked the end of a long period of difficult progress. Those years had been filled with awesome fear and doubt, as well as great intensity and, for me, worthwhile endeavour. Now a feeling of wholeness and well-being arose in the centre of me, and I felt a peculiar relief in the wake of this dream. This change in me apparently set the stage for a remarkable discovery. A few days later, I I arose in the early morning, feeling very energetic. I sat at my desk to read while Nina slept. I turned to a volume of essays by C.G. Young, which I had often examined before. In particular, I turned to some chapters from the interpretation of nature and the psyche. When I came to the concluding chapter, I read something which, though I must have seen it before, never communicated to me as it was about to do. I think it would be valuable to quote the entire passage as I read it at that that time, as I read it at that time. It may be worth our while to examine more closely from this point of view certain experiences which seem to indicate the existence of psychic processes in which, in what, are commonly held to be unconscious states. Here I am thinking chiefly of the remarkable observations made during deep syncopes resulting from acute brain injuries. Contrary to all expectations, a severe head injury is not always followed by a corresponding loss of consciousness. To the observer, the wounded man seems apathetic in a trance, and not conscious of anything subjectively, however, consciousness is by no means extinguished. Sensory communication with the outside world is in a large measure restricted, but is not always completely cut off, although the noise of battle, for instance, may suddenly give way to a solemn silence. In this state, there is sometimes a very distinct and impressive feeling or hallucination of levitation, the wounded man seeming to to rise into the air in the same position he was in at the moment he was wounded. If he was wounded standing up, he rises in a standing position. 
If lying down, he rises in a lying position. If sitting, he rises in a sitting position. Occasionally, his surroundings seem to arise with him. For instance, the whole bunker in which he finds himself at the moment. The height of the lev levitation may be anything from 18 inches to several yards. All feeling of weight is lost. In a few cases, the wounded think they are making swimming movements with their arms. If there is any perception of the surroundings at all, it seems to be mostly imaginary, i.e. composed of memory images. During levitation, the mood is predominantly euphoric. Buoyant, solemn, heavenly, serene, relaxed, blissful, expectant, exciting are the words used to describe it. There are various kinds of ascension experiences. Jantz and Böhringer rightly point out that, wo that the wounded can be roused from their syncope by remarkably small stimuli. For instance, if they are addressed by name or touch, whereas the most terrific bombardment has no effect. Much the same thing can be observed in deep comas, resulting from other causes. I would like to give an example from my own medical experience. A woman patient, whose reliability and truthfulness I have no reason to doubt, told me that her first birth was very difficult. After 30 hours of fruitless labour, the doctor considered that a forceps delivery was indicated. This was carried out under light narcosis. She was badly torn and suffered great loss of blood. When the doctor, her mother and her husband had gone and everything was cleared up, the nurse wanted to eat and the patient saw her turn round at the door and ask, do you want anything before I go to supper? She tried to answer but couldn't. She had the feeling that she was sinking through the bed into a bottomless void. She saw the nurse hurry to the bedside and seize her hand in order to take her pulse. From the way she moved her fingers to and fro, the patient thought it must be almost imperceptible. Yet she herself felt quite all right and was slightly amused at the nurse's alarm. She was not in the least frightened. That was the last she could remember for a long time. The next thing she was aware of was that, without feeling her body and its position, she was looking down from a point in the ceiling and could see everything going on in the room below her. She saw herself lying in the bed, deadly pale, with closed eyes. Beside her stood the nurse. The doctor paced up and down the room excitedly, and it seemed to her that he had lost his head and didn't know what to do. Her relatives crowded to the door. Her mother and her husband came in and looked at her with frightened faces. She told herself it was too stupid of them to think she was going to die, but for she would certainly come round again. All this time she knew that behind her was a glorious park-like landscape shining in the brightest colours, and in particular an emerald green meadow with short grass which sloped gently upwards beyond a wrought iron gate leading into the park. It was spring and little gay flowers such as she had never seen before were scattered about in the grass. The whole... The whole... Demest... Mence sparkled in the sunlight and all the colours were of an indescribable splendour. The sloping meadow was flanked on both sides of by, by dark green trees. It gave her the impression of a clearing in the forest, never yet trodden by the foot of man. I knew that this was the entrance to another world and that if I turned round to gaze at the picture directly, I should feel tempted to go in at the gate and thus step out of life. She did not actually see this landscape, as her back was turned to it, but she knew it was there. She felt there was nothing to stop her from entering in through the gate. She only knew that she would turn back to the body and would not die. That was why she found the agitation of the doctor and the distress of her relatives stupid and out of place. The next thing that happened was that she awoke from her coma and saw the nurse bending over her in bed. She was told that she had been unconscious for about half an hour. The next day, some 15 hours later, when she felt a little stronger, she made a remark to the nurse about the incompetent and hysterical behaviour of the doctor during her coma. The nurse energetically denied the criticism in the belief that the patient had been completely unconscious at the time 
and could therefore have nothing, known nothing of the scene. Only when she described in full detail what had happened during the coma was the nurse obliged to admit that the patient had perceived the events exactly as they happened in reality. I have no idea how long I spent reading and rereading this passage and the surrounding material from Young's essay, but when Nina awoke to prepare to go to work, I was a changed man. I cannot overestimate the importance that data held for me at the time. It was as if the entire mass of heart impressive ideas and assumptions in works like The Lost Years of Jesus revealed that I began to adopt years before had been lifted away in a single moment. I had long regarded Young to be an important investigator into the true significance of human experience. I felt limitations in his method and some of his assumptions, and these would become even clearer to me later on, but I had learned that he could be trusted to observe data and report it without distortions and interpretations. When he interprets, it is usually apart from the language and material that he reports. Therefore, when I read this report of phenomena that transcends the boundaries of the ordinary model of man, typically presumed by Western culture, I was posit positively overwhelmed. I felt this was a key to an enorm enormous range of experience, now capable of honest and direct investigation, which would vindicate, parallel and extend the experiences that had long been the burden of my life. When Nina awoke, I flooded her with my excitement. I, it was one of the humanly happy, the happiest hours in my life to then. An extreme pressure and source of conflict within me had been drawn away. I felt that I could begin the practical investigation of a miraculous and spiritual phenomena that, up to now, had seemed impossible. And because they had seemed impossible, because they had been carried away with all the imagery of the lost Christ, I had been required to endure long years searching for an alternative solution. I was forced to pursue a description of the essential nature and freedom of the human being that does not assume more than the model of mortality that had been propagated in my university education. All in all, this passage in Young signified in me a liberation from mortal philosophy and all bondage to the form of death. In the weeks that followed, I took to ravenously reading whatever material I could find that dealt with occult phenomena, Merkel's religious and spiritual philosophy, and all matters relating to the process of liberation. I was particularly impressed by the documented evidence for out-of-body experiences and the better sources of spiritualism. The miracle that occurred at Fatima early in the 20th century seemed to me a remarkable and important event. As many as 10,000 of its witnesses, many of whom were non-believing reporters or passers-by, signed affidavits that they saw the sun wheel around in many colours and fall toward the earth. I was also profoundly impressed by the life and work of Edgar Case. I became acquainted with the I Ching in the edition translated by Richard Willem and introduced by C. G. Young. I used it several times over a period of month, of a month or more, and saw the laws of synchronicity described by Young demonstrated interestingly in myself and in those around me. The people I began to meet during that time also seemed to be coming at an appropriate stage in my life, and they came on a gradient, gradient suited to my own learning. At first, I met people who were mainly spiritualistic and religious enthusiasts. Then I met others who led me to read inter intelligent material that supported their philosoph philosoph philosophic and spiritual view. All of this was founded in evidence of the kind I was beginning to recognise rather than in the mortal philosophy of the establishment. Finally, I met a man named Howard Freeman at a party at Palo Alto. He was an occultist and the first man I had ever met who claimed to have experienced who claimed to have experiences of this unusual kind. He indicated that such experiences could be attained consciously and intentionally by a kind of scientific method. 
He told me stories of how he met his teacher, a woman who had alle allegedly maintained a physical body for over 600 years. She had demonstrated and taught him many unusual abilities. He led me to the source books of occultism. I read the works of H.P. Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, and a remarkable, even though I felt basically fictional, set of volumes by Bird Spaulding called The Life and Teaching of the Masters of the Far East. I was unable at that time to completely separate fiction and exaggeration from fact in the occult material. It seemed even less reliable than religious literature. It appeared to take masses of religious and spiritual law, which were the products of many centuries of traditional culture, and pass them through the emotional mind of a single medium, medium mystic intelligence. This gave it the force of a first-hand account, whereas it was actually a body of tradition in the secondary form of an oral literature. It also tended to deal with phenomena rather than matters of fundamental importance. Thus, I became very wary of literary influences and I desired a, a direct personal experience of anything pertaining to spiritual reality. But at least it was all an emotional symbol that did much to enlarge my ordinary humour and extend my growing impulses to real experience. At one point, I asked Mr Freeman if he, if he was to teach me. I told him I was now in search of a teacher for help in my own developmental course. A couple of days later, he told me that he had contacted his teacher and was told that someone else was supposed to teach me. I felt that he was mostly a genuine man. He made no effort to capitalise on my vulnerability, and his reply seemed altogether right to me, for I had begun to recognise a new psychic awakening in myself. In the occasional flickering of certain images in my mind, I had begun to recognise a communication about my future. In the weeks that led up to my meeting with Mr Freeman, I had grown more accustomed to operating in the manner that my own work had precipitated. The recognition of the coincidence between consciousness and external experience began to develop into a comfortable ability, such that I began to make use of the images that passed in a seemingly arbitrary succession through the mind. I saw that many of these images were signs of precognition. One image became a constant factor. I saw that I was to find a teacher who would be able to help me. I did not see the teacher himself, but in spontaneous visionary flashes, I saw pictures of a store where oriental sculpture and other oriental works of art were sold. It became spontaneously evident to me that this store was in New York City. I told Nina about this experience and, began to Im Im and we began immediately to prepare to leave for New York. We gradually sold or gave away most of our belongings, including my library of about 1400 volumes. I kept only a few books that seemed important to me, to my new line of study. These events led on toward the middle or end of June 1964. This is Robert the Cat, who was Adidas' first teacher. <laughs> 